Welcome back to Focus Geek. Today we're going to talk about pregnancy of an unknown location. I think this is one of the most difficult things to work up in the emergency department because there is so many things that this could be and that it could be an ectopic and be life-threatening or it could just be a normal early pregnancy. And so I think the diagnostic dilemma that exists is pretty high with pretty high risk. And I think it's important that we understand what we're looking at and what we're doing. So today I've invited Dr. Cody Bonk here to discuss a case of a pregnancy of unknown location, and later we'll talk about a beta quant and how that works into the workup. Thank you, Dr. Marks. If you've seen the previous videos, you should be familiar with our scanning sequence, but in brief, we recommend starting in a uterus long axis view using the curvilinear probe with your probe marker faced towards the patient's head, starting midline, scanning from the patient's right to left is the uterus long axis view. We then rotate to the patient's right and scan from the fundus to the cervix in a short axis view. Then we look in the right adnexa, left adnexa, and then we put our attention on any pregnancy-related contents or any abnormal adnexal masses or free fluid. The first view is a uterus long axis. Uh, you can see the uterus takes up the majority of the screen here. Sometimes it's not as obvious, so we recommend using the bladder as a reference tool as well as the vaginal stripe. Here outlined is the contours of the uterus, and our focus should be on the endometrial stripe. We, as we scan through here, we wanna focus on the endometrial stripe to see if there's any intrauterine contents, such as a gestational sac, but we're also responsible for everything else on the image. So we wanna look in the annexa and posterior to the uterus to see if there's any free fluid or any other abnormal findings. And we recommend starting from the patient's right toward the patient's left. So here we're on the furthest right extent of the uterus. And quickly we identify a stripe of anechoic fluid. Um, it takes the shape of its container, has an irregular border, so this would be concerning for free fluid. So as we go about this exam, we need to quantify and evaluate this area as well. So we're going from right to left. We see we have more of the uterus come into view and we should start seeing a cervical stripe through here and the vaginal stripe. More of the vaginal stripe and we see a little bit of the endometrial stripe coming into view here. And we see this area posterior to the uterus which would be consistent with more free fluid. And we're getting more towards the patient's left and to the farthest left extent of the uterus. So on that quick exam, we did not see any intrauterine contents that would be consistent with a gestational sac. So now we rotate the probe to the patient's right, and we are now in a short axis view. Since the cervix is anterior flex and anterior verted, on this image we have both the uterine fundus as well as the cervix. So now we are scanning from the superior part or the fundus, identifying our endometrial stripe, and we'll be scanning more inferiorly through the cervix. We see the vaginal stripe slash cervical stripe here, and then more, a little bit of bladder come into view, and as we move more inferiorly, more of the cervix. We then push our attention towards the right adnexa, keeping the uterus in our plane as a reference, but our attention is mainly in the right adnexa. So we can see our iliac vessels here and our pelvic brim down here. This will serve as our lateral border, and our focus again is on everything between these structures and the uterus. So as we scan through here, we don't see any obvious anexal masses or cysts. So we drag towards the patient's left, and now we are looking at the left anexa, still keeping the uterus in view. We have this structure here, which we further explore with this next image, which is the right location and right echo, echo texture for a possible ovary. Since we've seen free fluid in our other views, we want to evaluate for a significant free fluid. So we look in the right upper quadrant, similar to an EFAS exam. We have the probe marker towards the patient's head. We're scanning roughly in the mid-axillary line around the 8th to 11th intercostal space. What we have identified here is the liver and the kidney, and we're looking for any anechoic stripes between that and Morrison's pouch or the inferior tip of the liver, which is absent here. So in summary, on our transabdominal exam, 
We have no identifiable interuterine pregnancy. We have no identifiable ectopic pregnancy or masses. We do have some free fluid in the pelvis, but none present in the right upper quadrant. So our next step is performing a transvaginal exam. We'll have the patient urinate and perform a pelvic exam if indicated, and then we continue with the transvaginal ultrasound. Same protocol as the transabdominal. We start with the promarker towards the patient's head. We're in a long axis view, scanning from the right to the left, then rotating towards the patient's right, scanning from the fundus to the cervix in a short axis view, then right adnexa, left adnexa, and then any pregnancy related contents or any adnexal masses or structures that we identify. So our first view is a long axis. So the probe marker is towards the patient's front or anterior. So anterior, posterior, towards the patient's head, towards the patient's feet. We have outlined is the uterus here with the endometrial stripe. So again, we are scanning from the patient's right to the left, focusing on the endometrial stripe, as well as any physiological fluid or masses since we've identified previously in the abdominal exam. So we're scanning from right to left. Again, keeping focus the endometrial stripe as we scan. We see this structure here, posterior to the cervix. Uh, if you look closely, you notice it has a regular border. This is consistent with fluid with, contained within a loop of bowel. We have this structure identified posterior to the uterus, which is consistent with an ovary. Again, we're not focusing on the ovaries yet, but we'll keep a mental note of this location. What we haven't explored yet is the cervix. So in order to get the cervix into view, which is this structure up here, we need to angle more inferiorly. And as we do that, we notice this pocket of free fluid as well. And as we move along, we'll notice it continues through here. It appears simple, has no internal echoes. And we continue through the cervix. Now we rotate the probe marker to the patient's right and we are in a short axis view. Here outlined is our uterus. Again, we see more contained fluid, likely loops of bowel. We keep in mind our endometrial stripe as we go from the fundus down through the cervix. So as we continue to scan through, we're noticing there is no intrauterine contents. We're moving more inferiorly. We notice again, more free fluid which is better is that evaluated here in these additional images. Then we go through to the cervix. We then rotate towards the patient's right. So our hand actually moves towards the patient's left, but our probe looks in the right adnexa. We have the uterus still in plane. We also have this structure, which is consistent with the right ovary. We notice adjacent to it uh, some free fluid. And we'll scan superiorly to inferiorly to better evaluate this structure. What we don't see, we don't see any cystic appearing structures adjacent to it or anything that would be consistent with an atopic pregnancy. We then drag over to the patient's left and do a similar exam looking in the left adnexa. We still keep our uterus in plane and we identify this structure here with ovarian follicles. This is the left ovary. We then scan a little bit more inferiorly, and again, noting more free fluid. In summary, we have now performed our transabdominal as well as our transvaginal ultrasound. We now have a pregnant patient with no identifiable intrauterine or atopic pregnancy. What we did identify is a small amount of free pelvic fluid. No intraperitoneal fluid is identified. So this brings us to our next dilemma. What is the beta HCG? All right, thanks Dr. Bonk for that summary. That's a great example of a pregnancy of unknown location. It's a great review of the anatomy and the scan sequence and appreciate you going over that. Uh, to re reiterate, you know, great anatomy with some fluid in the pelvis. This really leaves us at a diagnostic dilemma of could this be a normal pregnancy or could this be a life-threatening ectopic pregnancy developing? So we use the beta quant to kind of help us along the lines of this. Now, you got to take it with a grain of salt. 
you got to think of this as basically a snapshot uh, time and a one-time recording doesn't always tell you a lot so we need to repeat this um, value often and help us to determine whether this could be a normal pregnancy or not. Remember that a single value neither tells you if it's a normal or abnormal pregnancy and even trending may not do that either. One concept that exists in emergency medicine that's often been touted is the idea of a discriminatory zone. And this was a, an idea that at a certain level you should see um, uh, signs of a pregnancy within the uterus. The problem is, is this just hasn't teased out as well as it should have. Should have. Um, a couple things. So the discriminatory zone, depending on where you were at, is anywhere between 1500 or maybe even 2000. And I'll post some links to some articles about this in the comments below so that you can look at this a little bit more. But essentially, if a beta quant was less than 1500, it neither helped you determine whether a pregnancy should be visible or not because approximately half of all ectopic pregnancies are found with a beta quant less than 1500. So really that value doesn't tell you anything there. And then there is some things to say that a beta quant higher than that still may not um, show you an intrauterine pregnancy by ultrasound. So let's look at this. If we assume that a beta quant starts out on day one at 10 and then increases by the, uh, by the standard accepted normal values, we see here in blue that a beta quant will increase quite rapidly and hit that value of 1500. And that would only put the patient at 21 days from implantation, which would be about five weeks from their um, last menstrual period. Now we know at five weeks that we often don't see a lot of signs of pregnancy within the uterus and that we may not be able to tell uh, whether this is an IUP or not at that point. And in the green line, we see one that is only increasing at about a 30% rate, and we can see that that takes up to 45 days to hit that 1,500. So if this is an ectopic pregnancy and you're scanning them at day 39, they still wouldn't be at 1,500, and that ectopic would still not have a value uh, that's above that discriminatory zone. So I would really caution you about using the idea of a discriminatory zone. ACOG also came out with a statement on uh, tubal ectopic pregnancies. And they said essentially that a, it should not be considered an ectopic unless the value is greater than 3,500 because they, there's even documentation of normal pregnancies being present with values of 6,500 as the initial beta quant when nothing was seen by ultrasound. So the beta HCG is a valuable thing, especially when trended and to see what the value is, but it should also just indicate to you that you need to be looking by ultrasound. And so the way I think about this is if it's um, less than 3,500 and you're not seeing any complicated structures, um, you know, talk with your obstetrician and you're probably good to let that patient go home or have close follow-up. If it's above 3,500, you need to be talking to them about whether this needs to be treated as an ectopic or not, which I still think is a little bit of a difficulty. One thing I would encourage you to do is go out and read this article that was in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, by Dr. Barnhart. Uh, this was about ectopic pregnancy and this really puts away some of those ideas about a discriminatory zone and then also talks about how a beta quant and value should increase over time. One thing that I think is interesting when we talk about a beta quant, again I mentioned this before, if we look at um, how that beta quant should increase over time, if, if a patient gets pregnant at or ovulates at 14 days into their cycle and that implants within the next couple of days and we have an increasing beta quant, we'll hit that discriminatory zone or the, the 1500 on day 23, which is about five and a half weeks, which is pretty consistent with what we should see by transvaginal ultrasound and things that have been reported. But again, like I said, Previously, that green line shows us if that's not a normal pregnancy, when that beta quant's gonna hit 1500. And when we think about this, if it takes that long to hit, we're still hitting about eight and a half weeks before we'd hit about 1500. And traditionally, it's between about eight to 10 weeks that an ectopic pregnancy will get large enough to rupture. So if you're continuing to wait for that value to hit 1500 and not doing repeat ultrasounds, uh, that may put, be putting your patient at risk for rupture and um, impending complications.
Understanding the limited role that beta-HCG has in assessing for an ectopic pregnancy, we are left to really rely on our ultrasound to determine what may be happening. I would encourage you to proceed with caution when you have an empty uterus at all times. However, if there's an addition of an adnexal cyst, you really have to be concerned about an ectopic pregnancy. This simply raises the risk of an ectopic pregnancy by 10%. In addition, there's some absolute stops when you should not be discharging your patient from the emergency department. Any patient that has unstable vital signs uh, with the concern of an ectopic pregnancy should not be discharged from the emergency department. This includes not only hypotension, but also tachycardia. In addition, ultrasound findings that indicate that it is an ectopic pregnancy would be a tubal ring, a complex adnexal mass. Any patient with moderate amount of pelvic free fluid uh, should be considered to be an ectopic, or if that fluid is complex. In addition, if you see an adnexal gestational sac with a yolk sac, this is an absolute ectopic pregnancy. And you may also see a live ectopic pregnancy. And keep in mind that a live ectopic pregnancy or those with moderate amount of pelvic free fluid are not candidates for uh, or medical management of an ectopic pregnancy, but instead need surgical management. So when should you be consulting gynecology? I think really you should con consult them anytime that you're uncomfortable with the findings on ultrasound, regardless of the beta HCG. Uh, there have been reports of uh, ruptured ectopic pregnancies with beta quants of zero and non-detectable. And so that ultrasound and those findings or the stability of your patient really need to indicate when you should get the specialists involved for intervention. And don't be afraid to do that or, or concerned to do that. If you see any of those hard stops, that's definitely a time to get them involved. And if you're not, I think just making sure you have good established follow-up for your patient's important. And when should you have that patient follow-up? Well, if you have a pregnancy of unknown location, they're stable, they have no hard stop findings, then I think you're okay to have them follow up in two to three days. But it's really important that you tell your patient how important it is they follow up for that repeat testing. Often, um, I think they get feeling better, they don't have as much spotting or bleeding, and so then they don't follow up, and you need to really uh, let them know how important this is that they follow up for that repeat testing, repeat exams. And if you can't assure that that be done in the clinic, um, you should bring them back to your own emergency department if you're working in an ED or an urgent care or even your primary care clinic to assess them further. Um, you need to make sure, since this can be a catastrophic um, uh, diagnostic dilemma, if it's a missed ectopic, that they have good follow-up, whether it be with the, the specialist or back into your emergency department. Again, I'd like to thank Dr. Bonk for helping us uh, go through the images on this pregnancy of unknown location. I hope that you found the uh, conversation as far as a beta HCG interesting and hope that you'll look into that further. If you have any questions or comments about this video or, or any other related point of care ultrasound questions, feel free to email me at pocusgeek at gmail.com or comment below.